states, for example, in referring to a state of wakefulness, a sense of selfhood, or the capacity for self-reflection. But when we want to single out the mysterious quality at the heart of consciousness, it's important to narrow in on what makes it unique. The most basic definition of consciousness is that given by the philosopher Thomas Nagel in his famous essay, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And it is how I use the word throughout this book. The essence of Nagel's explanation runs as follows. An organism is conscious if there is something that it is like to be that organism. In other words, consciousness is what we're referring to when we talk about experience in its most basic form. Is it like something to be you in this moment? Presumably, your answer is yes. Is it like something to be the chair you're sitting on? Your answer will most likely be an equally definitive no. It's this simple difference, whether there is an experience present or not, which we can all use as a reference point, that constitutes what I mean by the word consciousness. Is it like something to be a grain of sand, a bacterium, an oak tree, a worm, an ant, a mouse, a dog? At some point along the spectrum, the answer is yes, and the great mystery lies in why the lights turn on for some collections of matter in the universe. We can even wonder, at what point in the development of a human being does consciousness flicker into existence? Imagine a human blastocyst just a few days old, consisting of only about 200 cells. We assume there's probably nothing it is like to be this microscopic collection of cells. But over time, these cells multiply and slowly become a human baby with a human brain, able to detect changes in light and recognize its mother's voice, even while in the womb. And unlike a computer, which can also detect light and recognize voices, this processing is accompanied by an experience of light and sound. At whatever point in the development of a baby's brain, your intuition tells you, okay, now an experience is being had in there. The mystery lies in the transition. First, as far as consciousness is concerned, there is nothing. And then suddenly, magically, at just the right moment, something. However minimal that initial something is, experience apparently ignites in the inanimate world, materializing out of the darkness. After all, an infant is composed of particles indistinguishable from those swirling around in the sun. The particles that compose your body were once the ingredients of countless stars in our universe's past. They traveled for billions of years to land here, in this particular configuration that is you, and are now reading this book. Imagine following the life of those particles from their first appearance in space-time to the very moment they became arranged in such a way as to start experiencing something. The philosopher Rebecca Goldstein paints a wonderfully clear and playful portrait of the mystery. Sure, consciousness is a matter of matter. What else could it be, since that's what we are? But still, the fact that some hunks of matter have an inner life is unlike any other properties of matter we have yet encountered much less accounted for. The laws of matter and motion can produce this, all this. Suddenly matter wakes up and takes in the world. The moment matter becomes conscious seems at least as mysterious as the moment matter and energy sprang into existence in the first place. The mystery of consciousness rivals one of the greatest conundrums ever to bend human thought. How could something appear out of nothing? Likewise, how does felt experience arise out of non-sentient matter? The Australian philosopher David Chalmers famously termed this the hard problem of consciousness. Unlike the easy problems of explaining animal behavior or understanding which processes in the brain give rise to which functions, the hard problem lies in understanding why some of these physical processes have an experience associated with them at all. Why do certain configurations of matter cause that matter to light up with awareness? 2. Intuitions and Illusions Now that we have a working definition of consciousness and the mystery it entails, we can start chipping away at some common intuitions. In large part, our intuitions have been shaped by natural selection to quickly provide life-saving information and these evolved intuitions can still serve us in modern life. For example, we have the ability...